the essential question we need to answer next is, how does the solution of a problem change when we perturb its data? Because we know that the nature of floating point arithmetic means that we have to perturb the data by a pretty small amount, and we are perturbing the operations too. So if the problem solution is very sensitive to that, we could be in for a big change in the answer. Here's a very simple problem that we can use to think about the concept. So we're just going to think about the problem of adding 1 to a number, which is like computing a function, right, which is f of x equals x plus 1. Now floating point representation guarantees for us that the difference between the floating point representation of x and x itself um, is small in a relative sense. So we'll call that relative difference plus or minus epsilon, where we know that epsilon is less than machine epsilon. So this is a very common thing for us to do. We can write that the floating point representation of x is x times 1 plus or minus this epsilon. Now to keep things simple, let's just suppose that the addition itself goes perfectly. So when we plug the floating point value of x into the function, we just add 1 to it exactly. So that means the difference between our solution on the perturbed data and the solution on the original data, when you work it all out, it's just plus or minus epsilon times x itself. So if we now make this relative to the true solution, f of x, then we can see that this relative change in the result due to perturbing the data is the absolute value of x over 1 plus x times that perturbation size epsilon. And so in one sense, this is good news. The perturbation to the result is proportional to the perturbation to the data. But that proportionality could actually be a very large number if this denominator is small. So in other words, we can get a large relative error out of a small relative perturbation. So to illustrate this more concretely, let's say we were doing five-digit arithmetic, and we had the two operands negative 1.0003 and 1.0000, then their difference is just negative 3 times 10 to the minus 4, which means that the operands both had five significant digits, and the answer only has one. So this is another manifestation of what we just did in more general terms above. And this phenomenon is called subtractive cancellation. We often refer to it casually as the loss of accurate digits in the result. Subtractive cancellation occurs whenever the result of an addition or a subtraction gives an answer which is much smaller in absolute value than the absolute values of the original operands. So now let's just step away from that particular example and think about computing other functions. So really a problem is just a function that maps you from a data value to a solution value. And if we just say for the moment that data values are real numbers and solution values are single real numbers, then we're just talking about ordinary functions. So now let's say we have our exact data x, and we're going to perturb that to a floating point value. So we'll now call that x tilde. So x tilde is the perturbed value of the data. And then that leads to a change in the solution which is just the difference between f at x tilde and x. So to get the relative change in the result, we divide that change by the original f of x. Now before we said that in our specific example, this ended up being proportional to the size of the perturbation to the data. So let's look at that ratio. Let's look at the relative change in the result all divided by the relative change in the data. So now, putting in the fact that x tilde is the floating point representation of x, we can say that x tilde equals 
x times 1 plus a small epsilon. Now it's hard to simplify this much further for a general function f unless we take a limit and let epsilon go to zero. After all, the whole idea is to see what happens with small floating point errors. So now if we do a little trick and we multiply and divide by x in our expression above, then this whole thing on the left suddenly looks quite familiar to us as epsilon goes to zero. It's just the derivative of f. So this gives us a nice compact expression for the ratio of the change in the result to the change in the data when those changes are measured in relative terms. So we're going to give a name to this quantity. We'll use the Greek letter kappa, a subscript of f to say which problem we're talking about, put everything in absolute values, and this is known as the relative condition number. Notice that kappa, like the derivative itself, depends on x. So this condition number depends on the not just the problem that we're solving, but the data that we're trying to solve it at. So now we can go back and put a bow on the example from before, given this function definition. And let's just now say it's x minus c before we had c equal negative 1. You plug that f into the formula for the condition number. And you just get this ratio of x over x minus c. So once again, that's subtractive cancellation. This number here, this is a condition number. It's large if the denominator is much smaller than the numerator. Here's a new example. Let's look at the problem of squaring a number. So if f of x equals x squared, we plug that into the formula for the condition number, and we get the result so that tells us the relative change in the answer is twice the relative change to the data. Maybe that doesn't sound good, but when you're talking about a relative change that's as small as 10 to the minus 16 to begin with, we can handle a factor of 2. That's considered very well conditioned. So when we're talking about errors due to floating point arithmetic, we expect that those errors get multiplied by a factor of kappa when we pass from the data to the solution. It's worth noting, though, that the analysis applies to any kind of perturbation, not just floating point arithmetic. So in the idealized world of math, we may not have to worry about that. But in science and engineering, we hardly ever know anything precisely. Even the physical constants that we know usually aren't known anywhere nearly as far out as 16 digits. In most problems, you might be lucky to have a few percent error on some parameters. Now, most problems aren't so simple-minded as having a single number as the input and a single number as the output, obviously. So for example, let's think about finding the roots of a quadratic polynomial. The data to this problem would be the coefficients of the polynomial a, b, and c. And the result are the two roots, call them t1 and t2. So f is really a function from three variables to two variables. Once we have the language for it, this is really not that much harder to generalize to, but that's a little ways down the road. So for now, it really suffices to just look at one thing at a time. Obviously, we might be able to do even worse if we perturb more than one thing at a time, but perturbing one thing at a time at least gives us a lower bound on the badness that can happen. So the roots are defined by setting the polynomial equal to 0. So if we think of a as the only varying coefficient, and the other two are held constant, then we can use implicit differentiation of this equation to find the variation of t with respect to a. So we apply the product rule and the chain rule. Then we can solve for dt dA. Now remember, t is meant to be a root of the polynomial, so it satisfies the quadratic formula. If you put that in and play around a little bit, you find out that we can boil this down to a simpler looking expression. Finally, to get kappa, we take this derivative, we multiply by 
a, which is the data, what we called x before, and we divide by t, which is the root, which is the solution, or f of x in our language from before. And if we put all that in, and we appeal once more to the quadratic formula, we get a pretty memorable expression, which is that the condition number is the ratio of the root t itself over the difference of the two roots. The conclusion is straightforward. The condition number will be large when the root is much larger than the difference between the two roots. In other words, when the roots of a quadratic polynomial are very close together, we can expect them to be very sensitive to perturbations in the coefficients. This is a general phenomenon. It's not limited to quadratic polynomials. It's true of polynomials of all higher degrees as well.